just to get into our message, I, we're going to be doing communion today, so I don't have too much time. But uh, as you guys know, we're on the series of Majoring in the Minors, where we have gone through the books of the minor prophets. And once again, when they say minor, that doesn't mean that their prophecies are, are less consequential or not as important. But just speaking about the volume of the books, these are some very small books in the Bible, like four chapters. So you can get through these books really, really quickly. And the last one, right before we make that leap into the New Testament, is the book of Malachi. If you've been paying attention, if you've been following on this journey with us, am I echoing? Yes. <laughs> no. Turn it up. Turn the echo up. I need y'all to know that this is from God. <laughs> So this is where we find ourselves. We find ourselves just a little bit after the children of Israel return from exile. They've been in Babylon. They've been under slavery. They've been punished by God for the things that they've done. And so after the season of punishment, the Lord has mercy, restores the nation, brings them back home. And they sit at home. They're thankful. Mind you, while they've been locked up, they've been praying out to God crying out, Lord, have mercy on us, show pity to us, and God does just that. Restores them, brings them back, and so now they're back in the land, they're, they've rebuilt the second temple, and as these things unfortunately sometimes go, they start to get comfortable all over again. Then they begin to do some of the old things that they used to do. And God has to raise up another prophet to give them another warning to make sure that they're remembering what just happened to you. Let me read John chapter 8. We're all familiar with this story. Well, some of you guys are, some of you are not. But it's the story when Jesus... Uh, let me just read it. It says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. This is John chapter 8. We're going to begin at the first verse. I'll give you some time to go there. But it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And then early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and he talked to them. And the scribes and the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders back in the day, and the scribes and the Pharisees, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Mm -hmm. Now they're trying to test Jesus Christ because we know that if you fail, to carry out the word of God, then we can write you off as a false prophet. Mm -hmm. But if you stone this woman, then you come, you lose the favor of the people because now you're no better than the Pharisees and these religious zealots who are so rigid in the law. So Jesus is caught between a rock and a hard place. What does he do? Then this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one beginning at the eldest even unto the last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman he said unto her woman where are those thine accusers hath no man condemned thee she said no man Lord and Jesus said unto her neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more to show you the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. What did they say? They said she was caught in adultery in the very act, right? Do we normally commit adultery alone? No. Usually there's somebody else there. It's like a two-man game, a two-person game. Father, forgive me. 
This is usually a two-person game. So to show you the hypocrisy, they weren't concerned about true justice. Because how do you pull a woman off in the very act of adultery? And where was the man at? Reinhard Balky says that he believes that the man may have been one of the religious leaders. Like, man, Frank, get out of here. We have told you about doing this. Right. Now you head around the back, and we're going to hold this woman accountable for her sin. Drag her, once again, the hypocrisy. You cared not for the law of God. You cared to make a point. You did it to tempt Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ availed. And then the message that he gives to this woman is the same message that Malachi is sent to give to the children of Israel, which is, I have just forgiven you. I do not condemn thee. I've lifted the judgment. Now go and sin no more. And sin no more. So this is the condition of the people. Malachi begins... Chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, saying, God is speaking through this brother and saying, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? Mm. And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts, unto you? You old priest that despise my name, and you say, Where have we despised thy name? You know those people who mess up, but they act like they're not doing anything wrong? Amen. That's how the people responded to God. What do you mean? How have we dishonored thy name? <clears throat> Verse 7, he says, you, have, you offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. If you've ever seen Law and Order, SVU, you heard the word contempt. I hold you in contempt of court and whatnot. The word, the definition for the word contempt is the feeling or attitude of regarding someone or something as inferior, mm. base, or worthless, mm. that you regard it with scorn, a state of being despised or dishonored, a thing full of disgrace, disrespect or willful disobedience of authority. Jesus said, like, you come to me and you say, wherein have we dishonored you? He said, you approach the things of God with contempt in your heart. Mm -hmm. How, Lord, you offer polluted bread upon my altar? Verse 8, it says, and if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? So God would require them to offer a, a pure or spotless lamb or a bullock or uh, some type of offering on his altar. And he said, you bring me the best. And they were finding blind animals. They were finding maimed animals, mutilated animals, and just offering whatever mm -hmm. unto God. And so God says that if you offer the blind for a sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? He said, offer it now unto thy governor. Hmm. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. Hmm. Hmm. What are you offering up to God on the altar? Hmm. Let's make this thing personal. Because right. you know, like I know, we don't, we're not required any longer to, to, to go out there and, and slay a lamb and spill his blood and, and with hyssop offer it up to the Lord. That's not what we do any longer. Because we know that God says that you are the living sacrifice. Mm. You and life is that altar. God says, I want you to offer yourselves right. upon this altar. Amen. So this is the altar that we're offering. I mean, this is the offering that we're giving to God is the fruit of our lips. The work of our hands. The loyalty and the obedience of our heart unto the Lord God. So when you offer your offering unto God, are you offering the blind, the lame, these throwaway, half-hearted things unto the Most High God? Mm. And you know, just me personally, one of the most frustrating things to me in Christianity is the way that the saints respond to the word holiness. That just frustrates me sometimes. Because we hear the word holiness and immediately dismiss it. Mm -hmm. 
It's not even a question. We dismiss it as an unobtainable standard, and so, so we never really commit ourselves to it. We never entertain it as, a, as an actual standard that we have to reach in it. Look, I'm in school. Now, if the teacher identifies, well, my instructor is giving me this for the be on the test, you need to remember this. You, it's a gang of things to remember. Mm -hmm. And whenever he say, okay, well, this won't be necessarily required on the test, uh, chapter two, uh, delete. <laughs> I'm not even going to waste my time remembering that. I appreciate you telling me about it. I know that it's there in chapter two. I will not be wasting my time to even remembering it. I won't commit myself, it'll go in one ear and out the other, if I know that it's not going to be on the test. Mm -hmm. We treat holiness as something that's not going to be on the test. <laughs> that when you hear about it, it's like, oh, well, that's impossible. Next. <laughs> this is what the Bible says. He says, they measure, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Mm. See, our problem is that we have rarely seen a true man or woman of God living out the Bible or the standard that we've seen and acknowledged as holy. Mm. And so we look around and we see your neighbor just as corrupt as you. Mm -hmm. And so now your heart doesn't fear. Mm. You look and see the hypocrites just as abundant as you. The saints cuss just like you. They watch shows that they shouldn't watch just like you. And so because you see the standard being marred, you let yourself off the hook. Mm. Jesus said if you compare yourselves among yourselves, mm -hmm. that's not wise. When you measure yourself, God is not going to measure me by my wife's standard. Mm. He's not going to measure you by my standard. The Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Mm. Malachi chapter 2 verse 17 says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Mm. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Where is the God of judgment? Mm. I'm going to be honest with you. When you go through the Old Testament, you're going to find there's a lot of judgment. God is really trying to hammer this thing home to remind you that this stuff matters. Now, this is, this is the thing that uh, surprised me. Well, before I even get into it, let me ask you a question. What type of coffee do you prefer? Do you like, let me, by a show of hands, show me who likes iced coffee. Iced coffee is the bomb, Jack. I'll mess with some iced coffee. I will mess with hot coffee. Raise your hand if you're a hot coffee person. Okay? How many of y'all lukewarm coffee people? We got two. Look at that. That's the Lord. Look at that. Who likes lukewarm? Y'all like lukewarm that's been sitting there all day? Like room temperature. Y'all like room temperature coffee? Oh, my God. Everybody extend a hand. Go <laughs> pray that demon away. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is that, like, the, the same way I reject it, if you give me some ice cold coffee, I'll drink it. You give me some super hot coffee, I'll drink it. Give me lukewarm coffee, and I will spit it out of my mouth. There's nothing delightful to me about lukewarm coffee. And God is saying that. In the book of Revelation, he said that the same thing is that the condition of the saints. Well, I could accept you if you were over here. I can, I can work with you if you're over here. But it's this little bit of warmness that you have that's getting you in trouble. The reason why it gets you in trouble is because you know enough about God to know him. But you won't do enough with God to bear witness that you say you know him. You say, well, holiness is too high of a standard. We say, who can do such a thing? You. You better do such a thing. <clears throat> you better live holy before the Most High God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29 through 31 says, Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye 
shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that saith, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A couple months ago, I came across this, uh, this quote, and I guess it was based on this psychology or English teacher trying to highlight the importance of punctuation. <coughs> So he laid out this phrase, and the phrase said, a woman without her man is nothing. Then he said, okay, I want all you guys to add the punctuation to it. So naturally, all the men went and wrote a woman, comma, without her man, comma, is nothing. And then the women followed it up with the punctuation, a woman, semi, or a colon, <laughs> a woman, semicolon, without her, comma, man is nothing. <laughs> See, just a little addition. Uh, words mean things. They looking at the same sentence. <laughs> a woman without her man is nothing. She said, no, a woman without her man is nothing. There's two words that kind of get us caught up. And the same way you approach that, they can be flipped to highlight a very, very humble individual, or they can be flipped to identify a very arrogant individual. And those two words are, I deserve. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why it's so dangerous to use this word, I deserve, it's because for the, for the believer, he knows that, look, I deserve judgment. I deserve wrath. I know what I'm getting. I don't deserve. Right. He has a right assessment of who he is. He has a right assessment of who God is and how he ought to relate to God. But there's a, there's a person that says, I deserve it. If you get offended, I was, I'm reading this book right now called The Sayings of the Desert Fathers. And he, one of the saints goes up to one of the old fathers in the church and he says, Father, how do I live a life that's holy? How can I possibly obtain this holy standard? He said, I'll give you an example. I want you to go to a graveyard and I want you to dig up a corpse. I don't know if he really did this or not. But he said, I want you to dig up this corpse and I want you to beat this corpse up. I want you to insult it. I want you to kick it. I want you to do what you can to basically defame this corpse. So being an obedient servant, he goes out there, digs up a corpse, insults it, kicks it, do, does all his thing, does what he does, so it comes back and he tells the teacher, I did what thou has asked me to do. He said, okay, now I want you to go out there this time and I want you to compliment it. I want you to lavish it with praise and I want you to lay flowers at its feet. So he goes out, he does that. Then he comes back and he says, I've done what you have asked me to do. And he said, now how did the corpse respond when you beat it up? He said, it didn't respond. How did it respond when you gave it praise? He said it didn't respond. He said, now when a man counts himself crucified with Christ, when he counts himself a dead man, then he is responsive in the same way, both to the criticism and the celebrations of men. He said, you will live a life of holiness when you cease to be affected by the opinions and the glory of men. Amen. He said, I want you to live like a dead man in this world. Amen. If a person can say something and it hurts you to the point where it causes you to step out of yourself, mm. you're not dead yet. Amen. If a man can compliment you and you become proud, mm. you're not dead yet. Mm. You must die. Jesus said, I want you to die daily. Mm. Amen. And I don't know if you like me, but, but my flesh is everything in me has a will to live. Right. My sin has a will to live. It resists death. Right. It desires to live. Remember what Jesus said. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. God is saying like, look, if you follow after me, 
What I want you to do is I want you to lay your life down. I want you to lay it down of your own accord. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. There's something in me that's alive, and it's not me. So the same way you can't destroy Jesus Christ with insults, I'm immune to your insults. Now, I'm not saying I'm there yet, but we have to identify the standard and recognize that it's possible to get there. Mm -hmm. right. We've been taught wrong. We've been taught that we shouldn't even bother with it because it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. But Jesus made sure that you understood that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Amen. So today is a new day. Mm. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow may never be yours, but you have this moment. Right. And I don't know what you did. You may have fallen on the way to church. But this is your moment. In Micah chapter 7, verse 8, it says, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. We have a tendency to play the greatest church hits. Yeah, like y'all remember that song, like I surrender some, right? <laughs> oh, y'all remember that song? Look at y'all, some of y'all ain't old school enough. Look at that. I ain't even that old. No. <laughs> Do y'all remember that song? I surrender some? <laughs> what is it? Hold on, say it again. It's I surrender all. Is that how the song goes? Can you imagine if we sang that up to the Lord? I surrender some. <laughs> it's like, what? Hold on. <laughs> Can you back up, brother? <laughs> what do you mean, I surrender some? It sounds silly when you say it out loud, don't it? But how do you walk before the Lord? Amen. I surrender some. The pastor said, brother, y'all not standing on the promises. Y'all standing on the premises. Mm. You just in the area. You just in the building. Uh. You around the spirit, but it's the spirit in you. Right. I can identify. I can. This ev did you know that there's evidence yeah. that I can tell where he is? Mm. That I can juxtapose where the spirit is compared to you based on how you live. Mm. Who you really are is who you are in the dark. Yeah. When nobody sees you. Mm. When you think nobody's watching you. That's who you really are. And don't think that just because you offer something unto God that he's bound to accept it. Wow. And that was the point. They was just coming to God however. Talking to God however. God said, look, you offering the blind on my altar. You doing, you putting anything before me. Hmm. Don't you know that your body is a portable church? Yes. I wouldn't think to come in the church and go in the back room and smoke a blunt. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't think to sit in the kitchen and just knock down a bottle real quick. Because right. for some reason, I believe that this is the house of God. Mm -hmm. When in fact, this is just the house that we gather in. Right. You are that tabernacle. Yeah. You are that moving thing that carries the Shekinah glory on the inside of you. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, mm -hmm. God goes. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, the church goes. Yeah. So if you wouldn't Get drunk in the back of the building right? because you believe that the spirit is here. Then why do you get drunk at home wow. where the spirit is there? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not thinking about this thing properly. Right. Would you take, you wouldn't do half the stuff in the church that you do at your home. Because right. I don't know who taught you that you are the temple of the living God. Yeah. Will you yoke God together with a harlot? And don't think that just because you offer something to God that he would accept it. Saul mm. tried to offer something before God. He said, I have done the will of the Lord. God said, go and annihilate the Amalekites, all of them. And he did a little bit. He did enough to be lukewarm. He did just enough for the will of God to get rejected. Cain offered something to God. Was it accepted? So we know that you can't just put anything before him. He's 
holy. We need to remember that again. Mm. That, it, that it matters how you approach God. Yeah. It matters what you do in his presence. God said, when I come back, I'm coming back for a church without spot or blemish. But we have been sitting in a, in a church age that like Malachi said, like what, what did God say? What was his indictment against Malachi? He said that you have wearied the Lord with your words. I'm sick and tired of hearing this. Mm. He said, you have wearied me with your words. And ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, everyone that doeth evil is good. Hmm. Right. In the sight of the Lord. We extend so much grace to ourselves. Hmm. We extend so much grace to, the, to, to, to the, the defilers and the rebels and, and the sinners. When God said, look, I understand that there's, there's, there's a beginning point. But in a time when you ought to be on meat. You are still needing milk and you still need to be taught the elementary things of Jesus Christ. Mm. You have Buddhist monks who set themselves on fire and they subject themselves to all types of extreme conditions in devotion. You have these Indian ascetics who hold their hands up and who hold their hands up and strain themselves for years. Mm. You have Muslims that take swords and beat their backs till it drips with blood and, and they'll kill and die for their faith and you got believers who can't even pick up their Bible. Wow. Don't even remember to bring them to church. Wow. Don't read. We get, it was like, it's, it's like the state of our youth. Here I go. It's like the state of our youth is a reflection of us. Yeah. You ever notice that? Like back in our day, we used to actually have to work for stuff. And now kids, man, they get mad when you ask them to get up off the couch. That's how we are. Back in the day, man, the saints used to fast. The saints used to go spend all night tearing in the Lord. Mm. We spend 15 minutes to feel like, man, we done did the most. <laughs> yeah. We can't do nothing for God. Mm. Is he so small mm. and insignificant in your estimation that you will spend 30 minutes easy on Facebook, two hours easy on Facebook. When it's time to commune with the Lord, you can't get out of his presence fast enough. Great. Amen. But of course, this ain't how you grow a big church. To grow a big church, I got to tell you, hey, brother, that little bitty daily devotional, daily bread you did, man, that's perfect. <laughs> you wouldn't eat a snack all day. Right. But that's what you feed your spirit. Wow. And he's supposed to just deal with it and live on it. Mm. You better preach. <laughs> Malachi was saying, look, Man. we just came through extreme persecution. We just received the judgment of God. We, we just came out this situation. Mm. Now y'all back to the very thing that got us caught up in the first place. I remember that. When I used to be in the world, and I would get drunk, and I'd be throwing up over the toilet, and I'd be praying, and I would mean every word that I said. <laughs> Father, never again. If you get me out of this, I promise, and this and this and that. And I was dead serious. And then I'd wake up, get dressed, and now where was I? <laughs> Jesus said, this is like a man who beholding his face in, it's like a man looking at his face in a glass and walking away, straight away, meaning immediately, forgets what manner of man he is. Forgot what you were. I was before God. Don't you swear before God. Lord, never again. Because guess what? He's going to expect you to fulfill that vow. But like I said, we live in a generation of whiny, wimpy, weak believers, man. Myself included. Mm. Myself included. I ain't talking to y'all, I'm talking to me. <laughs> there was a man that made a vow in the Old Testament. He said, Father, if you help me win the war, I will sacrifice the first thing I see unto you. And he made it back from the war, and then the first person that ran up to him was his daughter. 
And he was like, oh, Lord, have mercy. But he carried it to completion. She accepted it. He let her know what the Lord has said. And, and once again, they just cut from a different cloth. A whole different breed that feared and respected God. He said, if I'm your father, where is my honor? Mm. If I'm your master, where is my fear? Mm. Treat me like you treat anything. This is one of the evidences that Malachi gives for this trend in us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Mm -hmm. And he said, even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. He said, return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? This is one of the things that you can do. This is an identifier. I'm going to give you a bullet point mm. for what it means to come back to me. A bullet point to gauge where your heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We talking about your money. Mm. Verse 8 says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? He said, in tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with the curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. He had to say that because some of y'all think that I ain't got it like that. I can't afford to pay tithes. God, like, no, brother, you can't afford not to. Amen. Check this out. Try me. You think that it's hard to trust me, and I get that. It's, it takes a little bit of faith. Sometimes it takes a lot of bit of faith. But try me. Obey me. Honor me. Bring the tithe into the house so that there's meat for my people. So when lights get cut off, we can turn the lights on for some, some of your brethren. For when they go in home, we got a storehouse. We don't need the government to help us. We got us. Amen. We are a self-sustaining entity The way it's set up Is that brother you eat from our bounty yeah. And if you think you ain't got it to give He said try me hmm. Bring the tithe Bring the offering The tithe is your 10% The offering is anything beyond that Bring it into the storehouse Let's find out where your heart is Because people funny about their money <laughs> You want to watch a relationship go south, loan somebody some money. You never want to see a man again, loan him some money. Well, if one of your friends getting on your nerves, get a brother a hundred dollars. You'll never see him again. I tried that with my brother though, and he keeps coming back. Oh, he's gone. Oh, oh, that's like feeding a stray cat, huh? It may backfire, okay. <laughs> To end this thing, I don't know how much time I have. I told you, I'll just get up here and talk. And then sit down when I'm done. To end this thing off, I want you to know that your life, your body, you are that living sacrifice on the altar. <coughs> the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps hopping off the altar. Right. Keeps wanting to get away. It keeps remembering that, wait a minute, I don't want to die. <coughs> God said, brother, you came to die. In fact, when you signed up, I gave you a cross. Ain't that what I died on? Mm. Any man who will follow me, take up your cross and die. Mm. If you're not ready to die, you ain't ready to live this life. The man says, the man who saves his life shall lose it. But the man who gives up his life shall keep it. See, this is an upside-down kingdom we live in, man. You win by surrendering. You live by dying. You rise by going low. Amen. You gain by giving. That's how the kingdom of God works. It's the upside-down kingdom. So these things that you offer to God, 
The fruit of your lips, let me just look, help you understand something. <clears throat> that in the way you offer something to God, you know what the Bible says? It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. In other words, there is a standard in God's heart called love. And this is how you get your offering rejected. Is there anything not done in love? Amen. It's nothing. He said, though you speak with the tongues of men and air, but if you don't have love, brother, the offering is rejected. Mm -hmm. right. Though I have all gifts and prophecies and I get up and I preach the best and I speak the best and I preach to millions of people. He said, brother, if you ain't got love in your heart, your Amen. offering is rejected. Amen. You give your body to be burned if, you, the, if it ain't in love. The offering is rejected. You can't just bring, you bring in a tainted lamb before me. A blind lamb before me. Mm. If it ain't rooted in love, if it's not rooted in Christ, mm. brother, it, it don't clear. Wow. But I understand all knowledge. Is it in love? Wow. And it don't clear. Don't you just put anything on my altar. Don't you just bring whatever before me. Yeah. The, the trial in this world is that the devil has set up a kingdom that loves pride, loves vengeance, loves hatred, loves racism, loves oppression, loves excess, loves greed. Right. Mm. And you are set in this world for a time such as this to raise up a standard against it. Mm. Where there is hatred, you so love. Right. Where they're unkind, you're kind. Right. This is what God is calling you, calling you to. This is the offering that the Lord desires. So to make sure that your new life in Christ is not you going back to your old life in the world, offer an acceptable offering upon his altar full of love. Yes. And it's not your things, it's you. Yes. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. Jesus. amen.